Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's fall webinar series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation by Joe Beckwith entitled A National Perspective on EAB. Joe is a National Operations Manager with the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, and has nearly 30 years of experience in regulatory agriculture. He began his professional career with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Plant Industry as a District Nursery Inspector. For the past 13 years, he has been with APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine Program, or the PPQ. He began his PPQ career as a pest survey specialist in Gainesville, Florida, then transitioned into a position of area manager with the Smuggling Interdiction and Trade Compliance Program. He currently serves in the position of National Operations Manager within the Field Operations Core Functional Area in Raleigh, North Carolina. Joe's current program assignments include EAB, pine shoot beetle, and various farm bill forest pest projects. He has also been involved with program management for gypsy moth, plum pox virus, fruit fly, European grapevine moth, and light brown apple moth. He is experienced in multiple pest detection surveys, emergency and eradication programs, including medfly, citrus greening, citrus canker, and others. Joe graduated from the University of Florida with a bachelor degree <clears throat> in agriculture. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions. So please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of these questions and we'll have Joe respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be emailing a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that I hope you will take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. If you're one of the first, um, we will, but if we hope that you will fill out the survey either way. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to amystone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be mailed to you, emailed to you within a week of today's program, and I will post Amy's email address in the chat pod as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. So we thank you for attending today, and Joe, Please unmute your microphone, share your screen with your presentation, and we'll get started. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you're seeing my screen now and you can hear me. Yes. Great, all right. Well, thank you, uh, Robin, for having me here today. I'm very uh, appreciative and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about my favorite subject, with, which of course is EAB. And I'm gonna be talking about it from my national perspective. And uh, what I'm really gonna be doing is giving you an inside look really at the inner workings of the Emerald Ash Borer Program as, as run or managed by the uh, USDA APHIS PPQ, which, which of course I'm a part of. And to get started, I'm going to give you a look at uh, the various components and what makes up the program as the whole. We have what we call core functional areas. There's three core functional areas or CFAs that uh, contribute to the EAB program. The one at the top you see here is the, the policy uh, core functional area that is um, 
operated or led by Mr. Paul Shalou out of Riverdale, Maryland, and he provides our overall program direction uh, for the program, and and he deals with funding issues. He makes sure that the allocation of funding that we get from Congress is distributed out among the rest of our core functional areas as, as appropriate. And then on the left, you have our science and technology core functional area. That is led by Mr. Scott Pfister up at our Otis lab up in uh, near Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. Scott is in there now for the recently retired Dave Lance, who you may have heard of. And we miss Dave a lot already, but uh, Scott is going to be a great asset to us there. And the Otis folks there, they um, provide work and uh, research for us uh, regarding lure and trapping systems, uh, regulatory treatments, as well as our biocontrol research and exploration for, for new biocontrols. And then on, on the right is where I'm, uh, where my perspective comes from is the field operations. And we, uh, as field operations, it's our responsibility to implement the, uh, the policy directives uh, from, from that we get from Riverdale. So to do that, we are conducting survey currently in uh, about 34 states. Uh, we have regulatory operations in 30 states, and we're conducting bio control rearing and releases uh, in about 24 states, and we are operating our uh, rearing facility up in Wright, Michigan. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we are involved in some outreach. So I'm going to talk about all these uh, various aspects in more detail as we go along. Now, first thing I, I uh, should point out uh, that um, we are still playing catch up basically here with, with this pest. EAV was here and undetected for a good decade before we ever had uh, regulations in place and a program working on it. So. Uh, we are still playing catch up, and I'm going to show you here just a little bit of history um, of, of our program. And here's a timeline uh, of EAB in the in the U.S. And you can see that we we think it got introduced uh, somewhere around 1990. So it had all that all that time uh, up till we detected it in 2002 to spread at will uh, unnoticed. And, and then, of course, from 2002 to the present, we had a working EAB program. And there's the timeline showing some of our, our major developments of the program. Uh, starting from 2002, um, our, we initially had no uh, survey tools for this pest. So the only, the only survey we could do was a visual survey. But we uh, immediately started a search for biocontrol agents. Um, in the summer around uh, uh, 2005 or so, someone had, had the idea of, of uh, using a girdled uh, tree uh, to, to, to draw in the EAB because, uh, you know, of course, it was determined that uh, EAB was attracted to especially uh, stressed trees. And one good, very good way to stress a tree is by girdling it. So that was our uh, survey method during that time period. And around 2007 is when the eradication uh, effort ended. Uh, it became apparent that uh, the, the EAB was not going to be contained. Uh, it was not going to be eradicated. Um, so that's where we ended there. And uh, just for 2008, we began our first biocontrol releases. Um, and 2009, our rearing facility opened up in Brighton, so we could start mass producing those uh, those parasitoids. Um, and then, uh, about that same time, too, uh, or during that period, uh, our our friends at Otis uh, developed this uh, purple trap for us, and that gave us a uh, an, a relatively effective and and inexpensive method for survey, and we were uh, able to uh, use that in a, in a nationwide survey effort. Now around uh, 2012, we had a big change to the to the program. That's when our contiguous quarantine was put in place. Uh, prior to that time, each uh, state that was uh, involved in the quarantine had its uh, had its own borders. Each state was operated as a separate quarantine. And um, in 2012, we uh, expanded that so that um, in a 
contiguous quarantine, you can move from state to state, uh, not leaving the quarantine area without having uh, extra certification. So that allowed the program to um, uh, focus resources more toward the, the leading edge uh, of the quarantine area. It's also about that time that our, we experienced a large funding decrease. It went from about $35 million at, at the time down to about $10 million. And you'll see that around 2015 mark is uh, when we hit uh, 1 million wasps released in, in a single year. So that was, that was a great uh, milestone for us. And up to the present there, this past uh, survey season, 2016, we instituted a, a nationwide uh, uh, survey uh, deployed through a contract. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a little bit as well. Now, when we look at what we're trying to protect here, um, it, it's good to, to keep in mind exactly where we are. We, it, uh, or it, it sounds like, you know, when you think about 30 states being infested, uh, it, it's, it sounds, sounds pretty bad. Uh, but this graphic shows, um, uh, if you look on, start on the left there, the, going on the left hand side, you, it goes from zero to 100%. So, uh, one bar is 100% of the ash range in the country. The the orange is, or red, it might look red on your screen, is the percentage of the total ash range. And the blue is the part that, that we uh, uh, know to be infested at this point. So uh, coming up to the present, uh, it, we're still looking at only about 20 Two or 23 percent of, of the available ash range is, is infested. So we feel like we still have plenty of more work to do here. And this is uh, just a, a look, another look at that uh, through a map graphic here. Uh, the areas in red uh, are the uh, counties that uh, have known uh, or uh, have been positive for an EAB detection, and the areas in yellow are under quarantine, but they are yet to uh, be found positive. And the blue board there, of course, is the, uh, the, the quarantine boundaries. And again, five elements uh, of, of the EAB program that I'm gonna be talking about, uh, survey, outreach, regulatory, biocontrol. I'm also gonna be talking about our uh, research and methods development that our Otis uh, folks um, do for us. And I'm going to talk some more about uh, some more things on the policy side um, as well as uh, our uh, border border protection. Now, this is our funding history. Now, I'm not a skier, but uh, if if this uh, if you consider this as a as a ski slope, I think it would uh, probably receive a black diamond rating. And according to the Outdoor Tech website, these type of runs are where you can get a little peace and quiet, except for the screaming. They are either very steep, full of bumps, or both. You don't have to be an expert to ski these, but, but it helps, along with a lot of confidence and sometimes even alcohol. Well, that's, that's kind of what I feel like a lot uh, as we um, suffer our, our uh, decreases in funding. Uh, it does make me want to scream occasionally, but uh, it's not all bad thing really because we've learned to work smarter and spend our, our money more wisely in the process by necessity really. So let me first start talking about uh, survey and I think you probably, uh, most of you are probably aware of or familiar with the Big Purple Trap. It's really our best outreach tool, as well as our, our main tool for our national survey. Now, our, our national survey accomplishes several things. It's, um, firstly, of course, it monitors the leading edge uh, of our EAB infestations, uh, and it helps us to identify the uh, outside pockets of infestation that have um, probably been created through the through the help or assistance of, of people moving uh, regulated materials. Helps us identify locations that are going to be suitable for our biocontrol releases and it also of course helps us uh, determine where to place our quarantine boundaries. Now as I mentioned uh, in, in the 
earlier slide for the timeline, we contracted out our entire national survey uh, beginning with this just this just past uh, season, 2016. Uh, the reason we did this is uh, we were looking at um, a, another substantial shortfall in funding uh, in, in the million dollar range uh, between 2015 and 2016. We, uh, uh, up to this, or before this time, we uh, conducted our survey through the, uh, the help of our, our state cooperators uh, using uh, cooperative agreements with them. We provide them funding, they do the work. Uh, we also used our, uh, our own PPQ staff in the field to uh, deploy some traps. And we also did uh, or were contracting out several states. So uh, we had to figure out a way to uh, drop our costs by uh, just about a million dollars in order to be able to deploy a, a reasonable and um, effective survey. So we looked at uh, those states that we were contracting and we, we determined that the uh, the price and, and the um, uh, the efficiency that we were getting through those through the contracts um, could probably be um, extrapolated out across the country and, and realize that same kind of, of of benefits. And so that's what we did. And in fact, we did uh, succeed in that in that um, in that goal. We trimmed our costs by uh, nearly one million dollars. And in the process, we were able to deploy. 2,000 more traps than we were the previous year. So uh, we're really satisfied with the way that turned out. And uh, of course, going into uh, our, our 2017 season, uh, we are gonna be contracting out uh, the entire survey again. And uh, this is just a map. Maybe uh, you all have seen this uh, before too, uh, but this is a map that uh, we produce uh, every week throughout the, the survey season, uh, knowing that the 450 growing degree days is the point where uh, the EAB, the adult EAB emerge. Um, this map uh, provides our, our trapping partners with uh, a planning tool uh, so that they know when uh, uh, the um, uh, temperatures are, are getting to the right point in their area, and they can use that to uh, help time their, their trap placement. Now we we uh, task our contractors with uh, several things. Uh, firstly, they they are responsible for identifying or being able to identify uh, the ash trees themselves, uh, because we require them, of course, to put the traps in uh, ash trees and and not not some other host. Uh, we uh, we need them to identify the most suitable site and and a tree within a designated cell that we give them, and I'll talk about the, our, our, those designated cells a little bit later. They're responsible for uh, the placement and the maintenance of the traps, uh, even when there's a uh, trap that uh, blows down or or goes missing. Uh, our contractors are responsible for uh, taking care of those as well. Uh, they're also responsible for uh, uh, inspecting the traps, uh, collecting the specimen, and, and disposing of the traps afterwards. Uh, we also asked them to do a visual survey of the environment uh, for ash trees, uh, looking for those that, that are exhibiting the signs and, and symptoms in proximity to the trap or, or the proximity to the tree that they are, they are trapping. Uh, they are also uh, responsible for uh, distributing educational material. Uh, when asked to, uh, um, they usually uh, attract a lot of attention when they're trapping, and uh, we like them to have uh, materials to, uh, to hand out when people that are, that are uh, interested. And we also uh, collect a lot of data from them, or they upload data for us in our national database. And I'm sorry, I just lost my, okay, here we go. Um, all right, now, the, also our uh, trappers are um, responsible for uh, knowing uh, or being able to identify EAB and knowing the difference between lookalikes uh, that may be on the traps. And some of these uh, include a two-line chestnut borer, uh, bronze birch borer, and even click beetles. They're, they're often mistaken for EAB just because of their shape. 
There's also the six spotted tiger beetle. Uh, there's some ground beetles and a chrysidid wasp. Um, they're mistaken uh, for EAB, usually because just because they're bright green color. And I bet you could probably pick out the real EAB on this slide and we'll make it easy for you there. Now, um, I mentioned the designated cell uh, earlier. Uh, this is what we, uh, or a tool that we use uh, to, to come up with these designated cells that we give uh, our contractors. This, uh, this tool is a, uh, it's called a detection likelihood model. And it's produced by our s and partners. Uh, actually, we have a, <clears throat> a very brilliant lady out of, out of Fort Collins that, that produces this, this uh, product for us. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what it is is a, it's an ensemble of four t st statistical algorithms. It uses information from uh, known positive sites, and it correlates that with, with other factors such as host availability, uh, elevation, uh, pathway factors such as, uh, you, you know, uh, proximity to campgrounds, uh, racetracks, that sort of thing. Uh, it even looks at, at, at moisture. Uh, uh, content of, of the ground uh, in that area. And it uses all those uh, factors to produce a risk rating. And <clears throat> it, uh, it goes from zero to one. And you can see on the map the, uh, the, the, the areas of high, highest risk are in red or orange. And I, I, can, uh, I can probably compare this to a, uh, if you've ever seen a hurricane model, uh, during hurricane season, especially if you live anywhere on the east east coast or southeast or Gulf Coast, uh, you'll usually see um, several several um, lines of of, uh, of the models that they're using, and the average is out to come up with that projected path of the hurricane. Well, this is very similar in that this uh, averages uh, the results out from all these uh, four uh, different algorithms, and and that comes up. Uh, with the uh, risk rating for us. And on this map, if you're wondering about the, the gray areas there, the gray areas, of course, are the the quarantine uh, area that are masked out because once we place a quarantine uh, in the federal quarantine, then we no longer are, are doing survey uh, there as part of our, our, our regulatory uh, detection survey. And this is what our, our just our past season uh, turned out to look like as far as trap placement. There are approximately 15,000 dots on there that you should see in purple. And you might also see be able to see uh, some yellow um, uh, markers there. And those were uh, points where EAB was actually captured in the trap. And this past season, we actually added five states, five new states uh, to uh, to the list of, uh, of of states with with the EAB, so it was a very successful survey. And just here's another look uh, of it uh, with the the known distribution of EAB. All those red dots in there are are where uh, we have uh, known positive counties, and again the the blue outline of the uh, of the quarantine boundaries. And just another look at it again with the uh, the, the red uh, positive counties, and just overlaid on top of the um, the ash ash range, which gives you another look at um, you know the, the range of ash that's still uh, either not under quarantine or, or not infested. And you might be able to notice too the there's yellow areas on here that uh, are the areas of uh, potential urban ash locations, in addition to uh, the green, which is the the, the native, what we'd say the, we'd call the native range, and uh, as I mentioned too, the uh, the trappers with the big purple traps they always create a lot of attention, and uh, people walk up to them and, and are very interested in what they're doing. And in case you weren't uh, aware of it, we do have a uh, publications site on our APHIS website that you can go on and you can order. Uh, hard copies of uh, of a few publications that we have. You can go on there uh, and search for 
uh, under EAB specifically, or any other uh, pest that uh, that USDA or APHIS deals with. Um, and so you, you can uh, take note of that uh, link there, uh, but if you don't grab that here, um, you can just go to aphis.usda.gov and, and make your way to the newsroom and look for publications and you can, you can order there. Uh, oh, I will mention that the, the, uh, that site was having some issues, technical issues lately that I've noticed. Um, so if you go in there uh, in the right away, just uh, bear, bear with them if it's still not working correctly. So from there, that kind of leads me right into uh, the subject of, of outreach. Um, our, our outreach uh, overall has been uh, what we consider pretty, pretty, pretty successful uh, because it's, it's created a, a, a national discussion on firewood and EAB uh, is, is responsible for that basically. Um, and, but we do know that it requires a sustained effort. Uh, we, as everybody, has, has a, tend to have a short memory and um, we need to keep the, this message in front of people as much as possible and uh, so we have several measures that, that help us do that. Uh, one of which uh, I'll mention is our, our EAB national hotline. Um, our hotline I would say is very successful uh, to, and, and uh, of great benefit to those who call it um, and people find this number I should mention too through our through our survey if they walk past a tree that has a big purple trap in it uh, usually that tree trunk is going to have a, a, a label on it um, uh, stating that it's, EAB, it's an EAB trap tree and it has our EAB hotline number on it which is 866-322-4512 and I'd have to say that our our hotline is is successful mainly uh, through the through the efforts of, of one one main person and I'm going to embarrass her here in case she's listening her name is Sharon Lusick she Sharon is the nicest person you could ever speak to on the phone one thing and she really goes out of her way if she could move a mountain to help you she would and and you don't even have to take my word for it I'm, I'm just going to read an excerpt from a letter that uh, one of her satisfied customers sent to Secretary Tom Vilsack and in quote, after hours of research on the web and a pretty lackadaisical response from state and local officials regarding an emerald ash borer infestation on my property, I finally rolled the dice on a long shot and tried the USDA hotline number. I was a bit startled to hear a human being pick up the phone by the name of Sharon. I was further surprised by the pleasant attitude I encountered, her ability to articulate a response to my questions, and in the end, I was just outright flabbergasted by the professionalism personal conversation and incredibly simple and direct responses and overall information I had received. I'll make this short and simple. If the quality of service and the attitude I encounter when dealing with government consistently match what I got today, I would never again complain about my taxes. It's really that simple and was that different an experience. So Sharon, if you're listening, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm just very impressed that that uh, she can make that big a difference in, in somebody's life. And but you know what the truth is that uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to work with many people with similar qualities to Sharon, and and they're all very much dedicated to our mission and and helping out the people that we serve. I mean that's that's the people on the on the national level of the program as well as our our, our staff that are in the field uh, uh, dealing with people every day. Uh, there's just a great bunch of people. I can't say enough about them. Um, but, but moving on, uh, we also have some other um, uh, resources available on, on the outright, outreach sort of side of things. Uh, the next one on the list here is the Hunger Pest website. It's, it's put together by our legislative and public affairs folks, the LPA. They do a fantastic job with that. Uh, so if you can go to the hunger, hungerpest.com website, uh, you can, of course, see EAB there as well, well as ALB, Gypsy Moth, uh, you name it, all the, all the pests that are, that are in the news, basically, and that we're working with. And there's several different ways to connect w with them through social media, Facebook, uh, they're on Twitter, YouTube, and Flickr. I'd also have to mention uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Don't Move Firewood campaign. Um, 
uh, led by uh, Lee Greenwood. She does another fantastic job with that uh, website, and uh, APHIS does uh, provide funding uh, to that effort uh, pretty much every year, I believe, and, uh, and it's a great, a great resource. And of course, I have, since I'm on the EV uh, University uh, today, I have to mention the Emerald Dashboard Information Network, uh, another uh, spectacular website, which uh, obviously you all are very familiar with. Uh, now, let me just talk about the, our regulatory, our quarantine enforcement uh, efforts. We uh, get our authority from uh, federal regulations. It's a CFR, 7 CFR, 301.53. And that was, that's what gives us our authority to uh, to go out in the field and, and enforce the quarantines and, and do our regulatory activities. Uh, in addition to our federal quarantines, I mean, and when you think about a quarantine, it's it's not um, you know we don't we don't spread yellow tape around uh, around a property to, to 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 block them off completely. It's it's not like that. It's more a set of uh, rules that go in place once the EV or any regulated pest is is found in an area. And establishes guidelines for uh, movement of materials that are uh, at risk for uh, contributing to the movement uh, or the spread of the pest. So, and we work uh, very closely with the states. Um, and uh, when it, when a, a new state like one of the five states that would came uh, positive this year, when one of them came, comes positive with EAB, we work with them to. Uh, develop a quarantine, and those states, uh, generally speaking, they will institute a, a parallel and equivalent state quarantine, which matches very, very closely with our federal quarantine. The uh, states are responsible or, ha or have the authority to enforce the quarantine within the state, intra-state, and USDA has the authority to enforce the quarantine for interstate movement from state to state. And so we work very closely uh, with our, our state partners, state cooperators on that effort. And of course, our regulatory options uh, or actions, uh, they help to reduce the human assisted movement of VAB. And it uh, creates a consistent uh, set of regulations that, uh, that can be applied across all of the states. Without uh, the federal regulation, of course, each state would have the uh, the, the opportunity to create their own uh, unique set of regulations, and which could vary widely from state to state. So having one good set of, of, of regulations makes interstate commerce easier in that, in that regard. So <clears throat> one of our uh, issues, uh, issues that we have to deal with, of course, is as our quarantine expands to, to more states, uh, that continually uh, spreads our, our resources that we have to do the regulatory response uh, thinner. And uh, that's what we're dealing with uh, now. Um, we, we just don't have the funding that we used to have, uh, as I've kind of pointed out before, uh, to, uh, to put the, the number of people in the field and the number of hours that we need to, uh, to do that regulation. And of course, the, the states are having the same issue. Uh, many states are um, uh, lacking the funding that they need to do it. So uh, as we do with our national survey, we are looking for creative ways to, um, to, to reduce our costs in, in the regulatory uh, activity. So that's ongoing. And of course we find that it's, it's, it's probably uh, needless to say that trying to regulate both commercial and public pathways is very, it's a very challenging uh, aspect of the program. Uh, and the public pathways, of course, are are are, are harder. Uh, our our emphasis has to be on outreach on that because uh, we can't we can't put up roadblocks uh, to stop every every private citizen in their vehicle or their pickup truck with firewood in it uh, to stop. We just don't have the people uh, or the funds to do that. So uh, that's why, uh, or another good reason why outreach is so important. Uh, education is is more effective than than regulation in, in that regard. I'd have to say. And just uh, some of the regulatory uh, activities that we um, that, that that we are doing in the field that you want to talk about. Uh, typical activities are. Uh, Personal visits, our, our uh, officers in the field, they're going out in person uh, to visit, uh, to locate 
identify and, and visit uh, these people that uh, are dealing in regulated articles. Uh, they also can contact them by mail, email, or even telephone uh, to try to get those regulations explained, especially in a, in, uh, in a new area when, when EEB is found. They also are helping to determine if, if a treatment or, or the processing can be applied uh, to allow uh, uh, these folks to, to move the regulated articles out of the quarantine area. And they will issue the permits or, or certificates uh, that will allow that movement. And uh, we also have a, a, a tool that we, uh, it's called a compliance agreement. Uh, if, if somebody's in a regular business uh, or regular shipping, regularly shipping uh, articles out of the quarantine area, they can enter into a compliance agreement where they're agreeing to, to treat um, to, you know, the, to the certain level that we require. And, and we, we help certify their treatment facility. And, and then uh, under that compliance agreement, they can issue uh, their own stamps to their, uh, they go along with their product and for, uh, for distribution. And of course, uh, follow-up is required uh, to conduct uh, periodic site visits to make sure that they are um, maintaining compliance with their with their agreement. So now let me move into to biocontrol. And as I mentioned on the timeline there, the early timeline, our uh, exploration uh, through our uh, our science and technology side of the house uh, exploration started very early. And they, they traveled far and wide uh, to look for natural enemies for this new pest that we had back in 2002. Went to Mongolia, Russia, Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, so um, what they found in China was three major parasitoids. And they collected these between 2003 and 2005. And it's really kind of astonishing that that uh, we were able to conduct the foreign exploration, uh, find three potential EAB natural enemies, develop the rearing methods, uh, conduct the host specificity testing, and, and then apply for and actually receive a release per permit all within a span of five years. I don't know if I could say that was the first time that was accomplished, but uh, it's probably, uh, I think it's probably a rare accomplishment. But the, the three, the first three uh, that they found and permitted. Uh, oh, let me just point out too that there are no known English or common names for these pests. So forgive me for for using the uh, uh, the, the Latin names. But the first one is Oobius agrilli. This is an egg parasitoid. Of course, it lays its eggs in, in the EAB egg and develops that way. Uh, Testrastacus planipanesi uh, was another one. Uh, it is an endoparasitoid. It lays its egg inside the larva and, and develops inside. And then there was Spathius agrilli, which is an ectoparasitoid, uh, which lays its eggs on the outside of the EAB larva and develops uh, outside of it. So as I mentioned, the, the, all, every, every one of these went through host specificity testing to make sure that it, it would target mainly and only uh, EAB applied for the permit and uh, it resulted in a, uh, a FONSI, which is a finding of no significant impact, which uh, is basically they're saying uh, it's okay, you're not going to damage anything other than what your, your target is uh, with, with these organisms. So then that started uh, and release uh, permit was uh, started in 2007. Now the, the newest member of the team here is Spathius Galeni. Uh, it has a long ovipositor uh, that, that enables it to uh, attack EUB through through a, a thick bark tree. Uh, it shares that uh, characteristic with uh, Spathius agrilli. And it comes from an area in Russia that has a, uh, a climate more, more similar to our northern U.S. states. And it's uh, very species specific, which is good, of course. It, uh, it got unanimous support as well and releases started with it in 2015. And it is uh, uh, still relatively new in our rearing facility. We made some releases of it, uh, main, I think mainly in uh, uh, 
uh, for research purposes this past year. And I believe uh, we will be up in the full production uh, of it in, uh, in 2017. Now I just want to give you an idea of how the, um, how the biocontrol is, is produced. And I won't go into too deep a detail here because I believe we have um, uh, Ben Slager on, on the schedule for EUB University to give a talk maybe in the spring. Uh, Robin can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Ben is our, um, our, our rear and facility manager. And uh, so when he has the opportunity to talk to, to you all, he will go in, into terrific detail on this and uh, much more than I will today. But just giving over kind of an overall picture of it uh, and how we produce the, the, the eggs and, and mass rear the, um, uh, the, the colonies up there. They start out with logs that contain uh, the EAB pupae. Uh, they're kept in cold storage until they're needed and then they're put into these large cardboard tubes and then warmed up and then the, the adults will emerge, emerge and you may be able to see them in the picture here uh, and being collected in the uh, in the cup outside of this funnel. And then after the adults emerge they uh, are reared uh, out on ash foliage, uh, actual leaves from an ash tree uh, in, in these plastic containers and they will lay their eggs on coffee filters that are, that are just inside the lid there. Now I will say too that um, with the help of our science and technology uh, side of the house we are making progress toward an artificial diet uh, through an agreement with Dr. Alan Cohen at NC State. Uh, both uh, uh, we're, We hope to have both a, an adult diet and a larval diet in, in the near future, I can't say when it'll, it'll be uh, ready for production, but uh, once we do that, I think our production levels uh, will probably uh, more or less explode uh, because the, um, the the cost and 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 effort that goes into finding uh, leaves for the beetles to eat and and uh, and and the, the tree is parts of the tree, the bolts, what we call bolts, uh, parts of the stem uh, involved in, in the rearing process is, is very expensive and time consuming. The uh, artificial diets will make a huge difference in, in what we can do and, and what uh, uh, other future partners can do in the rearing process. Now, on from moving from the legs or eggs to the larva, uh, the those eggs are taken from those coffee filters, uh, and you can see parts of them there. They cut them, cut them in sections off of the coffee filters. Uh, they uh, attach them to the short pieces of, of logs that are kept moist. Uh, they're in, setting in a pan of water, um, and then uh, the eggs hatch. The little larvae bore, bore through the tree and start developing it as normal as they do in the wild, and they, they uh, develop normally on the logs there. And then just, here's just another uh, look at the uh, at, at the cups um, uh, in in the in the process here. So, uh, and uh, I don't know if you're aware that we are in the funny papers. This is the uh, the Mark Trail comic. They uh, are are this is uh, drawn at least by James Allen, and uh, they did a uh, a a series on EAB specifically, and in the process made famous uh, one of our own LPA um, uh, people <laughs> uh, by the name of, of Abby Powell. And, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, my iPad is next to me and Siri just uh, spoke to me. Uh, <laughs> but one thing I wanted to point out here though is uh, the uh, the wasp in a vial here is not quite so large as in what it may appear here. It is actually more like, uh, if you can see this little dot here, uh, that's more like the real size of of, uh, of the parasitic wasp. So, and the uh, the oobias are even smaller, I would say. 
this is, uh, this is a slide that shows some of our release methods. And uh, the original method was uh, to uh, send the wasps out in, in a container and open the lid and let them fly out. Well, our, our folks at the RIM facility are, are always uh, inventing new ways to improve on how we release. And uh, one here is what we call the oobinator. Uh, that is for uh, oobias to, uh, to be released. They uh, develop naturally and um, you know hatch out of their eggs and they uh, basically uh, disperse out of the container when they're ready instead of you know forcing them and you know tapping them against the tree to and, and telling them to get out basically they also came up with the idea of using the, the bolts themselves these bolts have eab larvae inside with um, the parasitized larvae they are sent to the field and hung up in the tree, and again, they'll, they'll, they come out uh, naturally when they're ready. And so the survivability uh, rate is, is increased with that. And uh, just to show you the, um, the releases that we've done so far, we've uh, conducted releases in 24 out of the, the total of 30 infested states. The areas in red that you can see are the counties that, uh, that we have released in. The yellow uh, are infested counties that have no such releases, so uh, we still got plenty of work to do. And after we release, uh, we we want to determine if they're surviving and thriving in their new environment. And for this, we conduct post-release sampling. And uh, and this is a picture of of uh, someone peeling the bark off and collecting those bark chips uh, and looking for eggs that are have been parasitized by obius and then and then of course they are uh, reared out in these in these tubes too and, and collected again in in cups similar to the uh, the way the adult eab are or are, are, uh, produced and i'll i'll just say that we've have now um, recovered parasitoids after release in, in 14 states and, and also in Canada. Uh, oh yeah, and we also use uh, yellow pan traps to, uh, to attract the, uh, the adults. Uh, some things that we've learned, that we've learned from recovery sampling. Uh, number one, Tetrasticus and Obius, they uh, have been successful. They are increasing and they are in fact spreading. The Spathius agrilli, it can, we found that it can overwinter in the northern U.S., but their populations are, are just not persisting the way we need them to. And of course, Tetrasticus has a short ovipositor and it, it's restricted to smaller diameter ash trees, so we're not finding it in, in the larger trees with the thicker bark. Benefits of uh, biocontrol. Um, it's, everyone agrees that uh, the parasitoid releases uh, and, and the development of a self-sustaining population is, is what's critical to, to achieve our overall program objective. Uh, the self-sustaining populations uh, are actually um, established now in, in locations throughout our infested area. And we're seeing increase, increasing parasitism rates of eggs and larvae at or even nearby uh, the release sites. And we have a good dispersal of parasitoids away from those release sites. So there's, there's more evidence all the time that uh, the replacement cohort uh, uh, of ash, the ash seedlings after you know, the bigger trees are gone, the seedlings, saplings, and the sprouts, they are gonna be afforded a, a level of protection uh, by the parasitoids that we're releasing. So our, our, our main plan here, our objective is to uh, get parasitoids released in, in every county that has been infested with EAB. Uh, that's one goal of ours. We're gonna continue our, our national uh, purple trap survey to help support our biocontrol effort. And we all are also hoping to increase the number of partners that are helping us in our release and recovery activities. Uh, we are starting an effort to uh, engage what we consult, uh, can term uh, non-traditional partners. We usually work with you know, state departments of agriculture um, and, and that sort of thing, but now we are trying to engage others uh, such as um, 
uh, the Morton Arboretum is one that I can that I can think of right now that uh, that we've engaged, and we're looking for others that uh, can have the resources and the ability and interest, of course, to to do the work on us. Because um, as I've mentioned, our funding is is uh, always reducing, and we um, need funding to do this work. Now there's um, there's some some questions uh, that we're trying to to answer. Uh, we're trying to determine if uh, the introduced agents such as Tetrasticus, along with native natural enemies such as woodpeckers and this native parasitoid that you can see here on the right hand side, uh, Atanacolis, uh, we want to determine if they've have reduced EAB density and to what degree even. So our our science and technology side. Uh, our folks there have done some studies over in China and Russia. They looked at ash that are native to Asia, and they found that the, uh, the resistance uh, was high. And in fact, the trees had to be girdled uh, to even get um, uh, EEB to attack them. Uh, egg parasitism was relatively high, as, as well as the larval. Now, when they placed ash trees that are native to the U.S. over there, uh, they found that the host plant resistance, of course, was much lower. Egg parasitism was about the same, and larval parasitism was was uh, even higher than I saw in the Asian ash. So overall, the uh, the, the the rate of EAB uh, reproduction was the same on the native and U.S. Uh, uh, ash hosts, but the host plant resistance was much more important for the Asian ash than it was on, on the U.S. ash, uh, or much more evident, I should say. So, and it's interesting to note, too, that woodpecker predation is very high in the U.S., but they rarely see that in, in Asian countries. And uh, it looks like I'm getting a little bit short on time here, so I'm, I'm talking fast. I uh, hope I'm not talking too fast, but uh, just some other areas from our science and technology side that they're working on. Uh, one of them is is looking to see if uh, there can be um, a, a, an integration of biocontrol and ins insecticide treatments. Um, so we're trying to answer whether or not systemic insecticides can save the large trees, while uh, parasitoid, parasitoid populations can can also be applied and actually increase uh, and, dis and disperse at the same time. And so we wanted to also, will the, will the suppression of the EEB populations allow the parasitoids to increase more quickly in, in relation to the host? In other words, uh, you know, will the EEB larva uh, still be able to out, outproduce uh, the parasitoids? Can we get the parasitoids to, to, to a level that they can uh, make a difference there? And, and so then, of course, can we eventually even quit using the parasitoids uh, because of the biocontrol and the native, the natural enemies uh, were, are going to cause a sufficient mortality. Uh, that would be a great result. So just in summary for the biocontrol piece, uh, our early results are very promising. Uh, Tetrasticus and Obius uh, are doing a good job of, of becoming established and dispersing. Uh, we will continue the re release Spathius agrilli, uh, not in the north, but in the south, uh, where we know they can they can survive, and Spathius galeni from from Russia that can do better in the north. We'll we'll release those mainly in the north, and um, oh, and we also see that EB in young trees, young ash trees, uh, they're suffering uh, a pretty high mortality from from the work of Tetrasticus and the woodpecker. So they're a good team together. Also, Tetrasticus is doing a, a terrific job of establishing and spreading even in urban areas. So that may be uh, the, the part that can really work in concert with the integrated pest management. And I just want to talk a little bit about host resistance. Um, we are, are funding some work in this area. Uh, we know that it's going to be important um, or we know that it is important in the persistence of ash trees and over in Asia. Uh, and and um, we see that EAB attacks only trees that are mainly stressed or dying. And in Asia, of course, the, 
the North American trees are, are attacked much more heavily and than Asian species. So it tells us that the, the host plant or the host resistance is very important. So in, and then when you plant uh, an Asian ash species in the U.S., they're able to persist in, in areas much uh, where EAB is much better than the North American species. So the uh, Forest Service and, and the PPQ, uh, we've supported uh, studies on host plant resistance. And uh, the resistance, that resistance of Asian ash has been confirmed in experiments, uh, as I've mentioned. And uh, North American and the European species are, are, are more susceptible. But these, these mechanisms of resistance uh, are, appear to be very complex. They use a, a, a variety of, uh, of chemicals uh, that they've implicated in this resistance work. So um, it's, it's difficult to identify all those. But uh, work on the genetics of the resistance ha has been started. So uh, host resistance, too, I, I've got to say, is, is a long term, very long term project. Uh, the disadvantage to it is that it's not going to protect the, our existing ash resource, um, really. Uh, the resistance varieties are not going to be available for um, an untold number of years. But advantages to it are that um, it may, in fact, be uh, a necessary uh, component of, of uh, having ash as a viable part of our ecosystems. Uh, it's it's going to be a long-term solution and it'll be self-sustaining. It's going to be compatible with our other uh, tactics, that we, tactics that we use, such as biological control, chemical control even. And uh, one of our goals for uh, developing uh, host resistance is including resistance to Chilara disease. If you haven't heard of that, that is a fungal disease uh, that is attacking ash in, in European countries. It doesn't outright kill ash trees, but it uh, weakens them to the point where other secondary organisms and disease, of course, attack them and resulting in eventual death of, of the trees. So uh, strategies, of course, uh, are, are to use traditional breeding methods uh, that exploit the lingering ash. Lingering ash, of course, are those that have survived the initial onslaught in the U.S. And so we're looking at those to see what what qualities they have that we can breed into other North American species. And of course, genetic transformation or, or, or GMO is, is one, one possible way to do it. Uh, and again, uh, I'm gonna move on to uh, what we're doing uh, more on the policy side of things at a higher level. Um, we are working in conjunction, or USDA, when I say we, I say USDA, working in conjunction with international services, doing uh, pre-clearance inspections, uh, treatments, and other mitigation measures over in foreign countries under, uh, and that's under uh, the direct supervision of, of APHIS personnel. And, and those uh, procedures are, are designed to mitigate the risk of, of the exotic pest introductions uh, by taking actions actually in the foreign country before the stuff ever comes in into uh, the U.S. Uh, of course, we're working at the border uh, with the help of uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, partners and our plant inspection stations that are operated by Plant Protection Quarantine, or APHIS. And of course, uh, across the homeland, uh, you know, once a, once a pest gets in and gets established, uh, there are programs like such as the EAB program that, um, that, that, that fight and try to manage that pest. Uh, related to imports, there are, uh, or there have been some finds of quarantine pests and, and Chinese log furniture that have been transiting Canada uh, in order to gain entry into, into the U.S. So that's, that's uh, created some concerns and there are efforts underway on the policy side of things uh, to address that. They are re re reworking uh, their regulatory manual uh, to, to make sure CBP is, is uh, familiar with how to regulate that, that material. They are working on uh, targeting uh, and, and intel to share with the CBP uh, to, to be able to detect those, those types of shipments coming in. And of course, uh, additional outreach uh, to, to the industry in, in the foreign country to make sure that uh, they know uh, the requirements of that. And our S&T folks, I uh, just wanted to talk about real quick about a, uh, 
an interesting uh, project they have underway. They are taking uh, intercepted um, live wood borers uh, from from CBP when they're when they're intercepted in wood packing material. Uh, they're working with six ports in this project, and they are bringing those up to uh, uh, Otis and under quarantine. They they are rearing those uh, larvae up to adult stage. So then the adults are then uh, identified uh, because it's it's also very difficult to identify the, the immature stages, and and a DNA barcode is produced um, so that they can use then use that to identify um, larval stages at, at the ports uh, in in the future, you know, which will be um, very very. Um, uh, effective for our uh, targeting uh, and and future survey uh, planning. Uh, also on the on the S and T side of thing, things are uh, they're looking at a vacuum steam treatment uh, as as an alternative to methyl bromide or or uh, dry heat treatment. Right now, it's being tested as a uh, commercial treatment on logs that are infected with oak wilt and thousand canker disease. Uh, but it may, it may be able to apply uh, to the other pests, such as a UAB. So uh, it's, uh, it's more beneficial and more practical to use on veneered logs than conventional heat because uh, it doesn't cause the damage to it that, that uh, dry heat does. And it's actually faster and more effective even than the methyl bromide. And uh, again, on the, on the, Import side of things uh, and, and policy, uh, as you may be aware, you know there's there's uh, the ISPM 15 regulations that uh, uh, regulate the movement of of, of uh, wood packing material coming into the U.S. and um, that is still in force, and um, uh, they are working to um, expand. ISPM 15 requirements to to uh, trade between the U.S. and Canada, uh, so that'll be good. And uh, they're also work, uh, organizing these workshops uh, to work with the trading partners uh, uh, to to improve uh, things such as, as uh, prosecution for violators and improved uh, treatment practices and that sort of thing. Now, our goal uh, and why we're doing all this, our our, our main goal is to maintain ash as a viable part of our American landscape. That's, that's, that's what we're working toward here. And, uh, you know, we'd like to see this, this picture, maybe not this picture specifically because we don't want, you know, we're, we're not advising people to plant, uh, you know, strictly ash trees along a street like this anymore. We know that we, we need to diversify our plantings, but, uh, even so we want to see ash, uh, still as a useful part of our, our environment. We do not want to see it go away and we're we're going to keep at it uh, until we get there. And just to uh, finish up with a, an old Chinese proverb there for you, but that's the end of my uh, of my talk. And uh, Robin, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, we do have some questions for you. Um, and thank you so much. This has been pretty interesting, kind of gives a good overview for those, especially those of us who are, are not particularly involved with anything APHIS. Um, good to know what you all are doing there. Uh, I have um, Enrico Bonello asked, is funding into biocontrol research and release determined by Paul Shalou's office? Um, well, it is a, is a group effort, really. Um, uh, Paul Shalou, myself, uh, and, and the Otis folks, we have a, an annual meeting where we get together and we, did, we discuss, um, uh, number one, what, what uh, accomplishments they've had in this, in this past year, funding uh, year, um, with their, their projects, and, 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 and we also talk about what f our future needs are. So it, it's all kind of agreed upon at, at, those, at those meetings. Um, it has a lot to do with what our total allocation for the program is and and what the we have to manage it or balance it between our needs of the field operations with what we need on the science and technology side of things so uh, it's kind of a balancing act but um, uh, yeah Paul, Paul isn't the sole uh, the sole determinator really I guess you'd say uh, of how much money goes into that 
Okay. He has um, another question here. Um, he says that you said that APHIS needs to use its money wisely, but why does money continue to go into biocontrol when we know for a fact that it will not work in the absence of host resistance? Indeed, North American ash species are killed by EAB in Asia, both Russia and China, where they grow in the presence of the same natural enemies and in their natural environment. I just think this is a serious conversation that needs to occur. That's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and, and we know that, uh, our, our, you know, I, as I've kind of illustrated, we are seeing some success with our biocontrol work. Uh, we, we know that we have a lot more to do. It's a long-term project. We uh, want to give it time to, uh, to develop and grow. And the, the host resistant side of things, of course, is a very, uh, we see that as a very critical aspect of it, but it's also a very long-term, long-term project. So uh, we will, um, you know, keep pressing forward as, as best we can and, uh, and try to develop all these systems uh, so that they can eventually work, work together and, and uh, you know, really uh, reach our goals with that. Okay, um, one more from Enrico. Thank you for your comments on the importance of resistance mechanisms. It's too bad there's not more funding for research in this area. It's true that this is a long-term solution, but it is even longer with the absence of funding. And the work on biocontrol has been going on for more than 10 years with no real control in sight. Wow, yeah, the, <laughs> um, that's true. I guess the, the best, best advice I could give uh, related to the funding is that, well, one thing you know, I I can't I can't go to Congress and and and, uh, and and advocate for for my own program for for more for more money. You know, we we basically are serving serving the public. Uh, we get our direction from Congress. Uh, Congress is 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 uh, serving their constituents. So uh, really, the best the, the best way I I would have to say to to make your wishes known about the need for for more funding is is to talk to your to your uh, your legislatures your elected officials um, I mean that's kind of how our our, our system works uh, if if the, uh, the the public at large uh, you know sees sees the benefit and the, the importance of of funding in any given area whatever it might be uh, you know that's 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 the way they can make it known is to uh, to, to tell their their elected officials. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks for explaining that. That's a uh, that's one thing we kind of need to know how we can how we can get that done when you know when we when people feel that there's a need and and there isn't who do they go to 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 the government to ask. So very good information. Um, I have one person who says on the trapping contracts. Are you working to make sure that the contractor gets the traps out at the correct time? Last year here in Georgia, they were several weeks late, which I think led to fewer trap catches than we should have had. Yeah, that's true. They, they uh, were late in several areas, but uh, uh, APHIS has to take the blame for that, <laughs> I would have to say, because uh, our allocations, uh, you know, well, like even even now, we are under a uh, continuing resolution currently uh, for funding, so we haven't received our allocation for the uh, the 2017 2016-17 uh, fiscal year. And uh, uh, last year, uh, we were in the the same situation, and the allocation didn't come through until very late. Uh, I can't even remember now, but it was like March or maybe into April before we got our final allocation. And so we couldn't uh, press the trigger, so to speak, on on um, on the contracts uh, until until received that allocation, then and, and knew in fact that we could pay for or what we contracted for. So we prevented them in that way uh, of in, in, in getting started. So um, we can't put that blame on them, uh, you know, in my. In, in my opinion, <laughs> and um, uh, 
there was uh, oh, and there was also uh, since Georgia was in the zone that um, we uh, experienced a um, a a, a um, can't think of the word, but any, anyway, some some somebody was disputing the 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 the, the uh, award of the contract, uh, a, a competing. Um, uh, vendor and uh, so that that also put a, a major delay in in getting started in Georgia so so none of which is, is the contractors fault um, all those kind of issues uh, shouldn't shouldn't happen uh, going into 2017 because uh, we don't have to um, solicit for, for a new contract we are exercising our option for the, uh, the, the second year of the contract so all those issues should be behind us. The only thing we have to worry about is that allocation uh, timing of that and when we receive it. Okay. Um, we do have a comment um, that says his, I think it's assumed, his assumed goal for biocontrol is set too high. This is an integrated approach to manage. And in time, funding will shift as more info and studies indicate that the direction changes. If that makes sense to you, that uh, I I don't know if that's. Hmm. Let's see here. I'm not sure, but but I can say that uh, you know again we 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 do evaluate uh, what we've accomplished uh, both in in the, in the science and technology side, the research that's done with the biocontrol, uh, and what what we need to uh, to have done or researched uh, for the future so and we we look at those things and we evaluate them every year so as we get new information we we try to apply the best science that we have in, in order to uh, you know uh, progress in the program so um, I mean that's the main thing I could say for that I think okay that finishes up the questions that I have. I want to thank everybody for um, participating today and especially to our presenter, Joe Beckwith. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this and giving us this information. Again, everyone, I'm recording this webinar, so it will be available for viewing later on um, the Emerald Ashbury University um, YouTube channel and um, tell people who were looking to, hoping to see this and weren't able to attend the live session that it is available. Um, if there are other questions, um, I hope that uh, you will contact me and I can forward those on to Joe or you can contact Joe and uh, we'll get some questions answered. So thank you so much. Um, as of this, I'm going to stop the recording.